Good evening, everybody. I'd like to call the October 2nd Scarborough Town Council workshop to order. Um, those present were all present, although t this evening Don Hamill is not here. He had a family um, emergency, so he is in Vermont and not here, and he called ahead and let us know. So, so with that, um, I think we're going to discuss the residential revaluation. And Tom, I think you've got a whole queue of things for us to, to review <laughs> tonight. So I'll turn it over to you for yeah, kind of an introduction. Uh, and as part of the agenda packet, we did put some kind of backup materials. There's a, a it's fairly dense, and uh, we appreciate that. But uh, I think they they do serve a purpose. We do have a PowerPoint that will kind of walk us through and, and make reference to, to these pieces as we go. Mm -hmm. but, and, but we don't expect to necessarily go through each and every one of these documents. Uh, tonight we can certainly come back if you like. Uh, Larissa has really headed up this project as project manager and so she, uh, understandably she's going to be driving tonight so to speak and certainly Dave uh, is here to collaborate and we're lucky enough to have one of your own uh, to have a, a part of the conversation as well. So without further ado, Great. why don't we get started? All right, so uh, this is our residential reval recap. <coughs> I do love a little alliteration even in tough topics if we can. Um, and so our agenda tonight... Uh -oh. <laughs> Technology's our friend. Oh, yeah. All right. Our agenda tonight, we're going to look at why. Why did we need to do a revaluation? Why now? We're going to walk through the process of that um, reval, the residential piece, the how. Um, and then we're going to toss it over to we're really really grateful that John stepped forward and offered his um, statistical analysis skills. We would have been able to pull something together to do some basic statistical analysis, but he has a skill set that we simply do not have and was really able to share that with us. So thank you, John, for that. So he's going to lead us through the what with the statistical analysis. And then Dave is going to kind of walk us through, we've heard a lot of questions about Higgins Beach, Hillcrest, and Prouts specifically. So we're going to just take a few minutes to look at those specific areas. Um, and then I think one of the most important parts of this evening is looking both back and forward. So what did we learn from this? What if we do this process again, what would we do differently? What did we come out of this process having a greater understanding of? I'm going to share with you some um, data tools that are now are going to be available outward facing on our website. A couple of them already are. And then Dave is going to share one path that the town might wish to take as far as future revaluations are concerned. And that should leave plenty of time for your specific questions that we'll do our best to answer. Um, and if we're unable to answer them, this evening, we'll make sure that we get those answers back to you and make sure that the answers are posted online as well so that anyone that's watching the meeting will have access to the answers that we're not able to provide this evening. So let's start off with the why. Why would we go through a revaluation? Or, and really, why do we even collect property taxes? Um, and so the answer to that is that's in the main state constitution. So these are the two sections that speak to that. And Basically, the, the state of Maine has said to municipalities, you will assess people a property tax and you will base it on their just value, which the Supreme Court is, has um, interpreted to mean fair market value. So what are the challenges in this and, and why does a revaluation really kind of bring those challenges to the forefront? Well, first and foremost, property tax is um, a very regressive broad-based tax. It is blind to people's ability to pay, and it is blind to people's longevity in their home. A lot of things change in 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And so if you moved into a small, sleepy town that didn't have a lot of market pressure, and so you were able to buy low, and suddenly <coughs> that town becomes a very popular place to be because maybe it has close proximity to the major urban center of the state of Maine and great beaches, you don't necessarily care about that. You enjoy the home that you've had for many years, and the fact that it is now more valuable to other people doesn't <coughs> change your ability to pay for that value. So property tax has some real um, kind of built-in challenges to property tax. And really, it's based on this very antiquated idea that somebody's property reflects their wealth. Because when this main state constitution and, and um, across the country property tax was established, we were an agrarian society. And the people that were wealthy had more land. And that's not necessarily true now. Very often we see people, especially that have been here for many, many years, are what we refer to as kind of land rich, but cash poor. And so if you inherited your home or if you've been there your entire life, you may have 50 acres, but it doesn't mean that you have the cash flow to, to maintain those at, at current market rates. So property tax is in and of itself a really challenging tax to work with, but it's important to note that it's the only broad-based tax that the main 
state constitution allows municipalities to access. So we don't have access to sales taxes and we don't have access to income taxes. So for a broad-based tax, we are relying on property tax. Um, so why now? Looking in the last couple of years, so the state of Maine uh, Revenue Services comes down and does an audit of our town and every other town in the state of Maine, and they come up with this, what's called a sales ratio. And basically, they look at the sales that took place over that period of time and the assessments to determine if your assessments are matching sales. Because if you'll remember, the requirement is that your assessments be at just value or fair market value. And so we saw that from 16 to 18, we were seeing a really rapid decline in that sales ratio. And so that really said, we've got to do this now. We're hoping that through this revaluation, our sales ratio, when we have this, the next audit, which will be next fall, we'll get that state audit um, information into us that will cover this period. Um, we're hoping to be about 97%. That was what we were aiming for. So a year from now, we'll be able to reflect back and see how successful we were in hitting that target. So how did we get to um, hiring KRT? We went through the process that we always go to when we're contracting a service. We, did, we released an RFP in May of 2018 that was looking for firms that were interested in doing a residential revaluation of just about 9,000 properties within a very tight timetable. They had 14 months to get the whole process finished. Um, we knew that it was going to be challenging to find companies that were interested in that work. We had gotten feedback before when we had done the commercial revaluation the year before that not a lot of companies had the um, staff capacity to do this size of a revaluation effort and certainly not in the time that we needed it done. So we only received two bids um, and the, um, both companies were invited in to come and interview with us. The interview team was made up of Tom, Dave, Sue Russo, our deputy assessor, and myself. And after the um, interview process, we were unanimous in our selection of KRT. And um, for better or for not, that really, and we really do feel it was for better, that was the selection we made. Um, and it was based on some pretty clear criteria that RFP is available online. You can see the, the scoring matrix on the purchasing section of our website. Can I just add something? Of course. Um, when, we, when we interviewed the two <coughs> parties, um, and we narrowed it to, towards uh, KRT. I did call a couple of assessors who had used them before uh, to get their feedback, and, and they, they, everybody gave me positive feedback about KRT. Yeah. Um, so then in your packet, your first thing that you'll see in your packet, um, and again, this is available online for folks. It's in the, um, under the town council agenda items. Um, you'll see a summary memo from KRT. I asked them to just kind of do a summary of, of how they saw the process and, and the pieces that they thought were important for people to see. Um, so some highlights of that, it's important to know that every property was visited. That doesn't mean that every property was entered inside. It means that every property was visited, a photo taken, and an exterior measure. Um, our entry rate after the callback process was 55%. According to KRT, the standard is 45 to 50 percent, so we actually did have an above <coughs> average um, entry rate. The analysis, KRT was really delighted and surprised when we first got together and they saw the sales data that they were going to have access to to build these models. 807 sales used for the model was a much larger sample than they were accustomed to having, even in a community our size. That We have a very healthy market with a lot of sales. Um, I'm sure that Katie and Jean Marie can speak to that. Um, and so we had a great base to be using. Um, they did a field review of properties. They um, also sent out the final valuations. I think it's important to note that before those final valuations were sent out, they did, it was a tight timeline, but they did have a chance to work with our department to um, kind of review some things. And before the final letters even went out, they had made adjustments to 650 properties with the assessing team, um, with just kind of helping to make sure that that was, those were as correct as possible before the mailing. Then we had the mailing, and that was challenging. And we can talk in a little bit about um, lessons learned and things that we could do differently. They then had the taxpayer hearings. We had those over a course of three weeks. I think it's really impressive that 18% of properties were, were represented in those hearings. It's a far, far higher percentage than they are accustomed to dealing with. When we first met with them to kick off this project, um, we were, we, you know, we worked through their timeline with them, talked about how much time we were going to need for the hearings. And they're like, you know, we usually meet with about 5% of folks. And I said, that's not going to happen here. 
so, so we really need to be prepared for a much more engaged populace than we see in some other communities. <coughs> Go ahead, Peter. No, I was just going to say, but, the, but in context, that's like one out of every five taxpayers had enough of a concern that they came in and talked to KR. Yep. But, Yep, that but should be a little bit of a flag for us, maybe or not. I don't. I don't think so because those meetings didn't result in one out of five taxpayers having had a poor assessment. It meant that one. It, I think it could be a red flag from the staff's perspective as far as what we could have done better from communication and outreach. I don't think it reflects poorly on the revaluation itself. I think part of it was uh, a lot of people saw large increases in their values. And obviously, the reason for that is uh, it took 14 years between revaluations. Uh, and then I think once people started talking with their neighbors and, and other people, they realized, well, they got large increases as well. So maybe that's the trend or, you know, or, or typical. Uh, but initially, I mean, I'm sure we all, we all experienced it, seeing that, that initial number uh, if it was a lot larger than what your current assessment was, that would be cause for concern. So, so that was 1,600 that KRT did. How many have you done in the process that you've had your doors open? Uh, well, I've been meeting with people uh, all day, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays for the month of September. Uh, and I've got another month to go. Uh, of those, the majority, the majority, I've made changes. Some very small changes, uh, you know, some larger. Uh, so, hundreds, hundreds of properties, certainly. But what hundreds? Uh, hundreds. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe a couple of hundred. Um, we also have had a, a healthy um, group of people calling and and coming in and not meeting with Dave, but meeting with Sue or Emily. So if some on the property card, if something says that it has four bedrooms and a property owner comes in and says, actually, we have three bedrooms. OK, well, that's a correction, you know, especially if there wasn't an interior inspection. That's an, a correction that Emily or Sue can make. There's no change in value for that. And I know that that doesn't make sense intuitively, but um, it's good to have the correct information on the card. So of those 1,600 properties that were represented in the hearings, some of those properties actually saw increases in value that came out of those hearings. And those people were very frustrated with us. And that was a hard conversation to have. But I met with one gentleman um, who was you know, he had had his hearing, and they had they had, had um, a shed on the property that he had taken down and was no longer there. And so they removed the shed, but the shed only had $400 of value assigned to it. Mm -hmm. During the hearing, they learned that he didn't have a crawl space. He had an unfinished basement. <laughs> well, that added $4,200 of value. And so when he got his final valuation, he was up 3800 from where he had gone into his hearing. Um, and that happened with a number of our property owners, where through the hearings process, pieces that got caught and, and, and discovered, and that caused an increase in value. So all 1,600 of those properties didn't result in a change downward. Some of them resulted in no changes because people made the properties really as we asked them, uh, <coughs> hearings rather, as we asked them to, to just get more information, learn how to understand their assessment. Um, and, but we did see some changes certainly through those hearings. And then um, the final piece that we're waiting for, they're going to produce a final document that they'll submit to the, um, the assessing department, and that will include a statistical report. And so we've got a bit of a teaser with John's, um, but we will expect further statistical analysis from KRT or different statistical analysis. I'm not sure exactly what they'll include in that. Okay, any other questions about this? Yeah, when you interviewed KRT, did you guys talk at length about their communication process once it was done? Was that something that you actually asked KRT? We did. We talked about um, what resources that you know we had available, kind of pre-reval, like photos of the of the people going out and the letters that they that they used. Um, I think this is one of the places that we really could have done a better job was having a, a after the after the um, the data collection was done and before the the value letters went out. What could that communication strategy have looked like? And that was a place that we did not do. And so, right. you know, I will own that. that was, yeah, sure. That's a lesson learned going right. forward. Um, part of it was a very, very tight turnaround. Um, we had a bit of a delayed start by about a month as we were navigating 
the, um, at the same time, if you'll remember, last summer we were converting over from TRIO to Vision, our new assessing platform. We had a bit of a, a tangle there um, for about a month, and it was preventing KRT from starting their work. So our already tight timeline got even tighter. And unfortunately, where we really felt the brunt of that was in the last in that month of August, where we really could have used more time, not just for um, further review before those values went out, but much better outreach to the community prior to those values hitting the streets. Does that answer your question? Yeah, right. So it's fair to say you didn't necessarily explore the end user experience, so to speak. Right. Not as thoroughly as we should have. Okay. We talked yeah. at length about how the hearings would be set up and what right. would be the best format for those hearings. Yeah. But as far as prepping, I don't think it occurred to any of us that we, which is foolish looking backwards, mm -hmm. there should have been an understanding that this was going to be um, much more challenging for folks than we had assumed it would be. Um, Katie. Well, I, I have a similar question um, to Paul, and I think you've mostly covered it, but I, I'm, I guess I'm throwing this out there maybe early just as a thought around, okay, how do we change this going forward? Is that, you know, it would it behoove us to include that when you're asking for an RFP, please include your communication yeah. strategy plan, whatever, um, especially on when you, because we send out a lot of RFPs. Um, for especially for bigger projects. So Absolutely. just make that a part of common practice and protocol. No, it's a great idea. By the same token, this is a professional company that does this all over the northern New England. And so in some part, we did rely on what they're proposing as a process and a timeline that they've used elsewhere and used successfully. So uh, it, but certainly there's a, a, a fair point to be made with some criticism. Yeah. And really, we really <clears throat> were so focused on the hearings and what those hearings would look like right. that we missed that that piece about, you know, certainly on the timeline that we discussed was when would the letters go out? How much time would there be between when the letters went out, when the hearings happened, when the commitment happened? But as far as the communication strategy surrounding those three points, that's where we, we dropped the ball. Yeah. All right, so uh, moving on to, are we ready to move on? Are we okay? Uh, Dave. Uh, first item is uh, software conversion. Of course, we did that last year. Uh, as part of the uh, commercial revaluation, we um, we we did the reval, the the new values for the commercial properties in Vision, and then we shifted the values over to Trio and committed taxes in Trio. Uh, in the meantime, Vision was <clears throat> uh, converting the Trio data that we had into their system, and there was a there was a problem there. I think it was um, a lack of good understanding on their part of the TRIO system. And uh, so that caused a delay uh, doing the commercial reval. And then this year, uh, there were further issues with vision uh, uh, working the bugs out of our system. So we've had some delays both years. Um, and so we got a, a later start again with the residential reval, uh, which shortened our time for review, uh, unfortunately. Um, see, public awareness, uh, I guess we could have done a better job uh, initially informing the public, uh, understanding the fact that not, not everybody checks the website, not everybody reads the newspaper and that sort of thing. But uh, so I guess the, the big question is how do we reach everybody? Uh, maybe if we could have started earlier, we would have had more time to uh, come up with different ways to do that. Uh, Just on that point, though, I mean, we as a community have, are, have been talking for now two full years about revaluation in two different steps. And so there's been conversation. Maybe some people were understanding the the approach and, and uh, or have forgotten about it, uh, but it has been at least in conversation around this uh, this group for just about 24 months now. And I think some of the things that we did, that the assessing department did really well, were those postcards that were batched so that people were aware of the, um, so we, we separated the town out into, I think it was six zones mm -hmm. for data collection. and about 45 days prior to a batch of postcards were sent out so that people were getting notification. Just as a reminder, this process is happening. 
they're going to be in your area soon, reminding people that if you see people lurking in, around properties, like, you know, don't be alarmed. Um, and that piece, I think, did go well. Um, I also was pleased with Emily Bain downstairs in assessing, did a great job of, of kind of having a consistent every couple of months article in the leader, reminding people about the revaluation process and where we were in it. I think she did a nice job with that. And keeping the website, there was a section, sec separate section devoted just to the revaluation, um, keeping that up to date and did a nice job of having like large posters. If you'll remember, they were in front of the elevator in the town hall, just reminding people, this is coming. Don't, don't forget. So I think the front end, fairly good communication. It's really that, that last couple of months where um, suddenly people had in front of them the impact of the reval, where that communication fell apart. Yeah, and ju just, to, I mean, I don't think, when we talk about the communication, I don't think it's a matter of, I, don't, I think the reval is coming was clear, but, but also socialized within that was the third, third, third argument, right? So we also set inappropriate expectations in some of our public meetings. So when we say, well, we did everything we did, could, I think we did to say, yes, the reval is coming, but I think we did a pretty poor job at setting expectations. So I think what we're dealing with here is a mismatch of results versus the expectation. So Agreed. just to add to the communication piece. But. And I'm, I don't lay that fault on anybody in particular. I'm just saying that that's no, the way good, it was socialized. Yeah, right. it's a good observation. Right. Uh, the three of us uh, were... Uh, keenly aware of the fact that we know the town better than KRT does. Uh, so we tried to stay engaged with all of them, their field people, uh, their supervisor, and uh, in uh, helping them to uh, uh, become familiar with the town. And uh, we tried to stay on top of things uh, to make sure that uh, that the information they were gathering and the the uh, methodology they were using was was appropriate for uh, for our town. Um, I sat down with uh, the supervisor Kevin Lee uh, on two occasions. We went through every single map and we uh, identified the neighborhoods and gave them uh, grades uh, from 50 all the way up to 95. Uh, the numbers indicating the, the, I guess, the quality of the neighborhood, uh, taking into consideration the location, the appeal, price range, and so on. Even the main roads, um, we graded those as well. Um, and I think we got those pretty well. There, you know, in a few places, there, there are some neighborhoods that can go either way. Uh, in, in a few cases, we, we probably missed it a little bit. But uh, the grading of the neighborhoods basically determines the, uh, the value of the lots, of the land. Um, and there's not a whole lot of difference between each, each grade. Uh, uh, and ultimately, when you add the building value, uh, if we missed the grade, if we mislabeled the grade, uh, you know, it wasn't a, a really big deal because the, di uh, the difference in value uh, between the grades was not that great. But uh, I, think, I think we got those pretty well. Dave, could you speak a little bit? I think that um, because in assessing we're using the word neighborhood, and then we just in our general lives use the word neighborhood, can you explain a little bit about how assessing neighborhoods differ from, so I could live on uh, Gorham Road, okay? But I could, that could put me in the same neighborhood as somebody who lives over on Holmes Road. Could you explain yeah, how that works? Right. Uh, for example, uh, yeah, the Gorham Road would be a 50 grade. The Holmes Road, uh, you know, the main roads that um, that have a lot of traffic would be graded the same. Uh, subdivisions with homes in the in the same price range would probably be graded the same. And of course, those are scattered all over town. So um, that's. That's pretty much the approach to, uh, to grading the neighborhoods and the land values. Just a quick question. So on, on neighborhoods, though, I, I think there were some very large neighborhoods with large numbers of homes. There were also some very small neighborhoods that were in, like, single digits. So how do, you, how do you assess values in those really, if there's only single-digit homes in a neighborhood, where do you get the, the like values or sales, or how do you, how do, you do that? Did we have neighborhoods with single-digit homes in it? Single-digit? Like, did we have a neighborhood with less than 10 homes included in the neighborhood? 
yeah, there's uh, like private roads and things like that, or small subdivisions where someone uh, split a parcel into three lots, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, I, I, I guess we, we look at sort of the, the price range where those mm -hmm. homes fit into, uh, and that kind of keys into uh, what neighborhood factor to apply. Um, the, the sales data is really the piece that informs the land value. Right, but if there's no, so if there's sales value over But if you, have, if you have a little subdivision on one side of town and another small subdivision on another side of town and one of them had a sale, that gives us an indicator of okay, where so that neighborhood should be. And if the other neighborhood is similar, the houses are similar, we apply the same okay, neighborhood so it, grade. So it to doesn't that. have to be sales within the right the neighborhood <laughs> specifically. It could be yeah, like no, not necessarily contiguous. It's okay. Thicker. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. If you look at a map, uh, if you look at the maps, that you'll see different grades, uh, neighborhood grades. Uh, you could see see them all over the map. When you did that, and, and I'm, I can only think of a couple examples off the top of my head, though, did you also then take into consideration, like, I know as a real estate agent, the bulk of our requests are Route 1 East, right, and kind of this quadrant, Black Point Road, I call it, you know, Black Point Road North. And so if I was comparing a, a, a street that only had five to nine houses, uh, you know, in that quadrant versus... West Scarborough, they would be very different in terms of fair market value mm -hmm. or the current market value, yeah. desirability, how. Right. So that's, you took that into consideration. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah obviously, uh, uh, a house in a neighborhood off Black Point Road, uh, say in the 500000 price range, mm -hmm. and you try to compare that to a house in West Scarborough, uh, in a neighborhood where the houses are three to four hundred thousand, you've got a difference there, totally. and, and a difference in the land value. So yeah. you've got a different neighborhood grade. So my house is average plus ten for my grade. So what would that mean? It's slightly better than average. <laughs> <laughs> you get a B plus. But is the average plus ten? A What's the average? Grade? Is the average is seventy five? Because you said between fifty and a hundred. No, that's the neighborhood. Uh, that's grading the neighborhood. Okay. That's a uh, neighborhood. Uh, oh, that's true. That's my building attribute. I'm trying that's to find my neighborhood grade. grade. Is it on here? Uh, no, it's just assigned to the neighborhood, I think. So that's not look on my on property, property card. card. Yeah. Look under, at the bottom of, of the front page yep. where the site uh, information is. Land, neighborhood R50. R50. Yep. Yep. Okay. What does that mean? You gave me a 50 from. Uh, but that, that's my actual, ta is that my tax mag neighborhood? Is that the grade that you gave me? That's, that determines your land value. Okay. That determines, okay. Okay. that's yep. an indication of, of what type of neighborhood you're in. Yep. And R50 indicates uh, a, a specific uh, site value for. So there's R50s the, all over town, correct? Yeah. Okay. There are. Yep. yep. Okay. So if I asked you to describe for me an R50, what would you say? Well, a lot of the uh, a lot of the main roads are, are like Gorham Road yep. would be an R fifty. Okay. Uh, okay. Right. Yeah. And and some of the older neighborhoods like like Pleasant Hill, the older subdivision in Pleasant Hill, where the where the homes are about fifty yep. sixty yep. years old. Yep. That's, yep. I think that's an R fifty. Okay. Yeah. That's perfect. Thank you. Uh, Reviewing the data and valuations, the three of us spent a lot of time doing that, just sifting through the property cards after they've been uh, produced by uh, KRT. I went out with uh, Kevin Lee numerous times looking at uh, properties and neighborhoods and, um, and also in the office looking through uh, the property cards to make sure that, uh, in my mind, that they were grading uh, the, the homes uh, you know the quality properly, and uh, uh, it was. Uh, we were very much involved, and uh, in fact, they they admitted that uh, our office was more engaged than anyone they had ever worked with. 
So we uh, we really we really wanted to make sure that they did the job right. Of course, with 8,500 parcels, it's impossible to uh, you know to to see everything and to review everything. Well, Dave will get into some fairly granular detail on some areas that were almost immediately apparent uh, to him. And had we had more time, I would hope and expect we would have caught those before mm -hmm. those values, the letters went out in the first instance. Um, and so uh, that's one regret we have, that we didn't have some more weeks, if not a month, yeah. to work with those values before they were released. John, you ready? Because sure. you're next. <laughs> We don't have a pointer or anything for when we get to. We some don't. Of the other but so I may stand up. If great. I think that's great. Sometimes I explain with my hands. Uh, <laughs> Starts getting excited about the data. Exactly, French Canadian. I get uh, it. I was going to say. Yeah. So I, I think I should clarify that I uh, was flying blind when I did this analysis. I had no inside knowledge as to the process that KRT used or the. Um, David's engagement or involvement in it. Um, I had no access to data that anybody else in town didn't have. Um, but I did have some experience uh, with producing models similar to what was done to um, uh, produce these appraisals. So I was able to look at it in a way that might help to explain things, and that's, that's really the intent here. Um, some of the highlights is on the first page that, that stuck out at me um, was that Higgins Beach and Hillcrest, um, Pinecrest, had the biggest increases. So the, uh, and, and that's clear both in the assessed values and in the market data that um, values in those areas went up more than any place else in town mm -hmm. over this period. Um, that was the original pass, though, right? The before-before uh, before adjustment? This is, I'm just talking oh, yeah. uh, prior assessment to uh, committed value. Oh, you are? So. Yeah. And I think I also heard you say sales data, that those are the two areas of town that have seen the greatest increase in, in the value of sales as well. Correct. Right, so the sold price on those properties has gone up more than uh, anywhere else as well. Um, so that's, uh, you want those to be consistent, but that's just so everybody's clear that those areas of town saw the biggest increases. Um, the new values that, uh, the new assessments that I was able to look at um, across a number of dimensions appear to mimic what the market is showing. Um, and I'll get into some of oh. I think you'll have to use it okay. on this. Okay, yeah, on the uh, just acclimating myself, sorry. Um, so the, uh, what you want when you're doing an assessment, I think, and I'm not an assessor, is uh, you're trying to bring everything, everything up to market value, basically, or as close to it as you can get. And uh, when I look across a bunch of different dimensions, whether it be area of town or um, construction type or your built, uh, the patterns are similar in that the assessed values are going up roughly the same amount as the, uh, what would be indicated by the sales data. Uh, and I, I think I can say this, and believe me, I would not if I um, didn't think I could show you in the next couple of slides that uh, the, the new assessments are, are more accurate, um, both overall for the town and for individual parcels. Um, and you have to remember that accuracy is a relative measure, but I think I can show you what I mean by that. Um, doesn't mean that the assessments are perfect. Um, and when you're talking about accuracy, uh, especially for assessments, you're almost always wrong, because uh, I maybe there's one observation where the sold price actually matched what the assessed value was. And I don't even know if that's the case. You might have zero. Mm -hmm. um, but what you're trying to do is make sure that your uh, difference between the assessed value and the sold price is minimized. So you don't want it to be dramatically different. And, uh, you know, I, I've gotten some examples from other towns that residents have, have shared with me that, that break down the data in a number of different ways. And I did compile some of that data yeah, let's take a look. And this is also, um, this slideshow will be posted online tomorrow, and these links will be live on that slideshow so folks at home can be clicking through this. And I've learned a lot just in the past day by reading the memo from KRT and, and from the assessing department and listening tonight. So um, understand that some of these notes were made because I did not understand everything that was done. But uh, out on this website, you'll be able to, you can click on, I guess, the summary charts uh, quickly. There's some... Uh, High-level tabulations of results by neighborhood or um, by decile, and we'll have some slides on this stuff as well. We're not going to go into the rest of it, but maybe you can kind of click on each, uh, click on neighborhood, for example, and I can talk through some of the metrics that are there. The actual next tab. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. 
So here I broke the, for this particular example, I broke the uh, town into sections based on geography. Uh, we typically refer to ourselves as being a part of different neighborhoods, so I, I said Blue Point is going to be south of Route 1, and I can actually show you a map of, of where that is. But I looked at, for Blue Point, there's 700, and the way I'm defining it, there's 793 parcels. Uh, the 2019 assessed value was $289 million. Uh, the median assessment was 355,600. Average assessment was just higher than that at 364,000. And then the metrics that I kind of geared in on, uh, if you look at the 2019 to 2018 <coughs> assessment in aggregate, in aggregate uh, it's 24% higher than it was prior to the reval. And I compare that to the comps uh, for Blue Point. There's 62 of them. And uh, Sold price versus the prior assessment was 23% higher, the 1.23. So this is my own uh, definition of an assessor's ratio that is not the same as uh, <clears throat> what Dave would look at. But if you look at that ratio, it's 1.01. So that means for the population of parcels that are in blue point, the uh, overall assessed value went up roughly the same as what the sales are indicating. If your number is drastically outside of one, that means that maybe something is not quite right. And that could be that the uh, qualified comps that you have for that particular area or dimension uh, are different than the population. So they're not representative of the <coughs> population. And if you have areas like, um, I have a couple up there that have 14 comps. I think Higgins Beach and, um, I call it manufactured, but that's Hillcrest and Pinecrest. Um, that's not a lot of uh, data to drive. So you're going to see more variability when you're, when you're trying to compare something like that. But even though the, the assessor's ratio for Higgins Beach is 1.02 anyway, so it, it appears to be pretty close to what the market's indicating. Um, so anybody is welcome to play with this on their own and share feedback. Uh, if there's something that's missing, uh, you can let me know. I don't mind slicing data and putting it out there. Um, so, so what are the red ones that are highlighted? So. Proud snack is 0.92. What is that? Yeah, so I, I put conditional formatting in there. So <laughs> if the ratio in those two columns, uh, either of them was either less than 0.95 or greater than 1.05, mm -hmm. I, it will automatically shade red. And that was just to help draw my attention to where there might be outliers. Um, so for the Proud snack example, the sold price to prior assessment is 1.09. And the 2019 to 2018 assessment is 1. And that's giving you a ratio of 0.92. Uh, and what you could interpret that, and the same thing with manufactured housing, is that the assessments did not go up as much as the sold pricing right. for those areas, but you only have nine qualified comps uh, to make that determination. And um, of those nine, we're not sure, especially in a community like Prouts Neck, how many of them are at arm's right. length full market sales and how many of them are between family or between um, Larissa Crockett and Larissa Crockett LLC. Yeah. So. Right. It gets really tricky to identify. But didn't their total assessed value from the prior assessment go down about $32 million? And that's a big, big change. I mean, most properties in Scarborough had appreciation in assessed yep. value. Prouts Neck had a pretty significant decrease. And I'm saying it'd be flat, but we might be mixing I what thought, we're calling I can, I can address Prouts that Neck. Yeah. Later. I, you were going to look at that more okay. deeply, Peter, right. if, if you... Okay. Yeah, so I probably drew what I'm calling Prout's neck might be a little different, but the, okay. it, for this purpose, anyways, it was flat. Okay. Um, Dave can talk. And I, I honestly, I don't think they included many relevant comps because Prout's neck is such a different beast. It may have skewed results elsewhere in the model. Um, at least that's, I, I probably would have excluded them because they're so different um, and probably require um, specific treatment. <coughs> So kind of, I think more to Larissa's comment, if we're, if it's hard to distinguish if the transaction is an arm length, arm's length or not, wouldn't that, wouldn't that suggest that the 1.09 is actually artificially low and not artificially high? Uh, they're qualified, so they should be arm's length if they're tagged as qualified. Am, am I interpreting that correctly? As, as best as we can tell. Right. Okay. But I guess I, so, but if we're saying it's hard to distinguish that, I mean, that number's not going down. It's, it would only go up, so to speak. In the sense where, and I'm assuming something that's not at arm length is selling for less than what it's worth. That's, that's, my, assum that's my underlying assumption. Yeah, correct, so right. 
Yeah, but yeah. I, I would oh. actually argue sometimes people pay a premium to yeah. grab a property before it hits the market, yeah. and so it can actually work inversely to that. So if it's, like you said, Larissa Crockett to Larissa Crockett LLC, you know, within a family, that's where you might see deals. But uh, I think that's what we're talking about. But here, it's though. not always the case. Right. Sometimes properties are conveyed privately to best friends, other relatives, and in that case, those folks end up paying more. Yeah. And you and overcharge your best friend for your house? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, there's, there's other Money forms talks. Of, you've got to find some new friends. There's, there's <laughs> potentially other forms of compensation <laughs> in addition to a, in a real estate transaction, and that happens more often than not, that the properties don't ever hit the market. They're sold privately, right. so they're not market tested. And historically, for decades, that's been a challenge for everyone that's sat in to mm -hmm. see and I couldn't say one way or another. Yeah, sure. Whether no, it, um, there wasn't enough data there to say if it was too high or too low for Prospect to me. It, it was a little bit, the ratio is a little bit lower, but it wasn't, I couldn't point to something that said it sure. should be higher or yep. lower. Nine qualified comps for Prospect versus the 93 or 230 in a different neighborhood. Well, how many, how many houses are in Prospect? So 303. Three. Okay. Parcels. Okay. So we're looking at 3%. Yeah, there's okay. Yeah, but it's still nine cents. Yep. Um, okay. Do you want to go back to the yeah. the slide now? We'll go to the next slide. I need to. I think tell us to play again. Hold on. It's for some reason, when I click off, I've got to go back into. John, I think if you're going to use the pointer, you should use it on here. Just I don't think it will show up on the um, <coughs> screen. I'm not sure, but well, the pointer might work. Uh, <laughs> So here, I'm going to try to explain this. And when I built models, I wasn't the statistician. And I wasn't the actuary, but I did lead the team. So I understand enough of the details to, I think, explain or I've tried to explain it before. Uh, this is, on the left, the, uh, the diagram here, is what the sales errors looked like before the rebound. Uh, and you can kind of see by looking at it is that the, the average was about negative 20%. What that means is that our assessment was about 20% lower than the sold price on average. Uh, now that's the average. Sorry. You're going to have some obviously on the left of that and on the right. And what you can see is that they're spread somewhat widely, but generally most of the data is between the, the negative 0.39 and the 0%. Um, in fact, 75% of the data falls between negative 39% and 0 um, after the rebound, you can see this is a little tighter. It's also centered <coughs> on zero or very near zero. Um, and most of the data, or 75% of the data, is within negative 12% and 11, a positive 11%. So what this means is that after the rebound, the average error is about 0%. Um, and 75% of the properties that were used to develop the model um, could be found within plus or minus 12% of uh, of zero, of, of the average. So that's, uh, I, I can't render an opinion if that's good or bad or great for assessing, but I think it's clear that it's better than what was before. So it's, better, are, it's a better bell curve. It's a better bell curve. So it's, you can say it's more accurate because you see it's tighter. Um, and you have most of the data is falling within uh, very close to the average. Now when you're building models, uh, you can get something that's called overfit. Or uh, it, it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy where you, if you have enough data points, like 795 sales, you can mimic based on if you have enough parameters in your model and match your data identically. So just because it's working well for these 795 sales, you also want some confidence that it's going to work well on the other 8,000 sales. So we did look at an independent sample, and uh, there's been sales. Good timing, Larissa. Uh, <laughs> since... Uh, this work was done between April and uh, July of this year. We actually had over 150 sales. Uh, these were, I, I did not have the, the luxury of having them qualified for me, so I had to go parse through some of them. Um, and clearly some of them were in progress at the time of the rebel. So I'd say this data is a little bit messy, but I think it's, um, it's pretty reasonable. Um, the error dispersion for these uh, uh, 150 sales since the model was developed was very close to what we saw on the previous slide. 
um, after the rebel. It's a, a 26 point spread for 75% of the data. It's not centered on zero. It's uh, the average more like negative 5%. Um, and you can interpret that to be that right now our uh, assessments are about 5% less than what the market is showing. Um, but I think that I've seen a lot of models when you try to apply them to an independent data set fall apart. And this one did not. It, it, so I, I, I think I'm reasonably confident that it's uh, reasonable. Do I have another slide? You do. I think I do. <laughs> if I could just make a point. Yes. One, one of uh, our concerns is that we, by virtue of our timing, we're hitting the, the height of the market, if you will. Oh, yeah. And this information gives me a little confidence that that's not quite right. There's the market still climbing potentially. Um, I was surprised to get 162 sales in that time period. That, mm. And I didn't compare it, so I don't have a benchmark. I'm just saying my intuition, that's, that felt like a lot. And then. Well, the benchmark is that the 807 sales that took place in the two years prior. Right. Right. So if in a three month period you had, I mean, certainly that was the busiest sales time, I'm assuming, well, yeah, spring and, and summer. And, yeah, between April and <coughs> July is, is statistically. When you have the most the sales, it, when you have the most sales in the in the market, and probably the highest pricing. pricing. Yes, in your highest price. Yeah. So I mean, something that would be interesting to do is in a year from now is to see how this looks. And um, I think the assessor does that, or the state does that, by comparing the sales ratios. It's really a very similar exercise. Sometimes it helps to actually visualize the the dispersion. Um, and it, you know, I'm speaking from not ex assessing experience, but data experience. Uh, I know that there's concern about data quality, and it's good to try <clears throat> to do everything we possibly can to make the data as good as we can. But typically, the people developing the model are going to use as much data as they can and then whittle it down to what the important aspects or points are. So you know, when you say it doesn't matter whether you have four bedrooms or three, that's not surprising to me. Um, you know, the goal typically is you're trying to identify what your, your strongest predictors are so that those are the ones that... Um, that drive things. And then you have somebody like Dave who can um, you know, look at that and p figure out where it's wrong. Because you know, the statistical version is going to be off 10% um, either way. And a lot of times, somebody with experience or local knowledge can help get you closer to zero. And to that point, one thing I learned is that this, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, the single biggest determinant in terms of building value is square footage. Yes. You know, the quality factors and the yes. number of bedrooms and bathrooms has a little bit of a Effect, but it's square footage is really what drives that. I was really surprised how consistent across neighborhoods the uh, our average building assessment per square foot was. It's about 126 bucks. That's the average, and there's definitely some dispersion for you know properties that are rated better or worse and, than that. And it should be. They're all compared to the same um, cost schedule, uh, Marshall and Swift. Question, question. So this so this this answers the question at the macro level that the whole town. Yeah. Seems to be reasonably evaluated in aggregate. How how far down into neighborhoods can you take a similar analysis to say, for some of the bigger neighborhoods, do they track the same way? I mean, can you? You can look at that. I, I mean, I uh, I didn't look at the distribution I, not, of not, errors. Not, yeah. not that I'm asking you to do it, but so. it, as a tool going forward, if we really are concerned about, geez, did we get Prout's neck correct? Looking at it from this lens might be able to start to answer that question. Is that yeah. a is that a so the bigger true? your sample of data, the more meaningful this mm -hmm. look is. What I did put on the the uh, web data was a coefficient of dispersion, which helps to measure the variance. Or yeah, how spread out. Yeah, it's a relationship of the variance yeah. to the mean and with standard deviation to the mean. So, um, <coughs> and you will see it's a bigger number for Um and it's a bigger number for your your lower and higher deciles, but it's really tight for. 80% of the population. Um, because that, that's my biggest worry. We, I think we've got the aggregate probably dialed in. Mm -hmm. It's are there still some big differences among neighborhoods and what we did. And, and I think a big part of, of doing it this way is you're setting up a model for how you can learn and get better. Yeah. And uh, like I said, we're plus or minus 10 to 12% now. Let's see where we can get next year uh, based on understanding what's driving the market. Keep in mind, this is a, a mass appraisal methodology, and so it's kind of blunt in certain areas, but it's not a surgical look, uh, not a property by property um, you know, appraisal process, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, also, when, when the state does the state valuation, when they come in and, and look at the sales and do their analysis, uh, 
they throw out the outliers and they throw out the low 15% and the top 15 So they're looking at just the middle 70% to do their analysis. That's uh, interesting to know because, like I said, 80% looks really tight. Yeah. And I have theories about why that the upper and lower deciles might be off. We're a diverse community. We have uh, a broad spectrum of housing here, and that, that's difficult to fit into one model. Uh, so that was my hunch, but I haven't tested it. And can, I just want to, if I can, just, John, just for a moment, use this as an opportunity. One of the things that I learned through this process, because, um, you know, residents will call, and, and they are upset about a lot of things, and, and Prout certainly comes to mind for people. There's, there seems to be kind of an innate sort of feeling of unfairness there. Like, this is our most valuable property. How could it be decreasing in value? While somebody who lives in West Scarborough in a modest home is seeing an increase in value. That just feels unfair to folks. Um, and so I've had a number of residents ask me, well, you know, if somebody can go in for an abatement, what happens if you, if, if you learn that you've undervalued that property? And I learned that nothing. <laughs> that, we, you know, we are, we are required by law to provide abatements, but we can only provide what's called a supplemental tax bill if we have omitted land or building. But Dave, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Um, yeah, we've got some situations where we could or we probably should do abatement uh, supplements, but um, we can't. Um, we can only we can only do them, like Larissa said. If we we had a couple of cases where we only had the building value or the land value. In that case, in those cases, we can do a supplement to add what was omitted or or missed. Uh, but that's about those are about the only cases where we can do that. So for the most part, we're just doing uh, <coughs> abatements. Because once we set the values, they're set. Uh, it's, it's not fair to go back and tell someone, oh, we, we decided the quality grade really should be higher, so we're going to increase your value uh, and, and supplement your taxes. Uh, it, that's not good for PR, so. But could you do it next year? Yeah. Okay. You can you can review it next year and and make adjustments and corrections, uh, which uh, we should do, um, because uh, we didn't get everything perfect. So, and, and I'm getting a little bit ahead because I never got to talk about this. But what John did, I mean, we're just fortunate that your skill sets here, because this is way above my pay grade. Mm -hmm. I could never ever do anything like this. Going forward, we need this type of skill set and statistical. I think going forward for just yeah. so we can every year take a look and see if we're still Yeah, sorted. it kind of tells you where you're going and, uh, and where you need to go. Yeah, I'm not sure if we can afford to have it on staff. <laughs> I, I don't disagree that having uh, this sort of uh, resource, <coughs> we can do it through contractual relationships uh, or be more important. Are you going to sign a volunteer team. agreement for the next five years from Mr. Cloutier? <laughs> <laughs> or the, 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 you know, the bid RFP process should, I don't know if it included sort of this type of analysis, but it probably should, we could going forward. Yep, the statistic, we will receive statistical analysis on the revaluation from KRT as part of their final report. Um, but as I mentioned before, I'm not sure what level or to what extent yeah. that will be included. I don't think it's going to be as user-friendly as what John's going to have. It's going to be more coefficient of dispersion and... Uh, Looking at things differently. I, I mean, <coughs> there's probably some chunks that we can peel out and uh, the assessing department could do on their own. There's nothing magical. Here. It's putting a graph together, and a lot of it you already do is just looking at it a little differently. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just doing simple uh, racial studies. Uh, you can do mm -hmm. them for individual neighborhoods, uh, classes of properties, uh, which you should do on a, on a regular basis. And uh, because different classes of properties move in different directions mm -hmm. or at different rates. So it's always, uh, it's... It's really trying to get, uh, trying to find out what, what the current market is doing. Uh, and to do that, you have to do analysis. You have to look at it on a regular basis. So. A general question, and forgive me if I've asked this before, um, but I don't recall the answer if I did ask it before. Was there ever a discussion at any point around um, omitting some of the properties that had, had been reassessed in the last three to five years? 
omitting? Mm -hmm. From the revaluation process? Mm -hmm. No. No. It was a no. town-wide revaluation. Right. I, I, I just, I know I've heard from a few folks who have been in that pocket that it's like, well, why did we get hit twice in five years, uh, whereas other folks haven't been hit in 14 years? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, that my answer was what you said. Yep. Uh, I just wondered if that had ever been a part of a conversation. Like, should we? Could, could we? Is that something we should consider? And I know going forward, we've talked about you know finding a way to divide the town up differently and do it kind of in sector sectors, which I think would be a better approach, um, so that you avoid something like that. But I just said I would ask the question as to whether that had even been discussed. That wasn't part of the conversation, but it does help explain why some of our waterfront communities saw smaller percentage increases right. than some of our inland communities. They had already been revalued far more recently, and so they weren't making up 14 years, whereas all of our inland communities had a much larger span of time to be right. compensated. And that's also us. partially why I wanted to say it out loud, mm -hmm. was because I want people to hear that. That's a great point. And then the purpose of the reval is to bring everything up to current uh, market value. So uh, if you go back a year, just a year ago, uh, values were different. Uh, values have gone up since then. So, and it's all about equity. So if, you, if you're doing a, a revaluation of the town this year, <coughs> and if you omit a neighborhood, uh, then you're really favoring that neighborhood. John, are you ready to go to the next Yeah, time? let's sit. I know yeah, we're just probably running a little time short, so I'll... Uh, saying what you want to get to. I'll, I'll fly through this one. Um, th this is just... A, a, we kind of looked at it in tabular form, but just the picture by neighborhood of uh, essentially the assessing ratio. But what I'm comparing here is the sales data in red, what that would indicate for the neighborhood versus the, the population that was actually assessed. So you're trying to see that if the population is going about the same place as the... Uh, sold policy, sold um, parcels that you had to develop your assessments. Um, you can see Presnac is a little bit off, but reasonably close. They're all reasonably close, with the exception of manufactured housing. Um, uh, eight corners is a little bit lower, uh, but th this is the only one that jumps out at you, and I, I think Abe will explain that a little bit later. Um, this looks at it by the size of the property, so these are your least expensive properties in town. These are your most expensive. Uh, nothing again that, and this is the same manufactured housing that's, that's driving that number, but aside from that, um, there's nothing that jumps out at me as, as saying it's drastically off. Um, this is break, broken down by these folks actually went down in value, had their assessments. So we had about 10% of our properties went down in value. And these, uh, as you move down from decimal one to 10, these went up the most. You see these went up over 200% according to the sales. Uh, according to what we actually committed, it went up about 175%. Uh, but everywhere is in the middle, and this is what I was alluding to earlier, it looks really tight. Um, you know, it looks like uh, the actual population in that particular demographic went up about the same as the sold um, parcels. This is another view, uh, another way to look at residuals. And Peter, I think you were, you were kind of asking about this. This is another way to look at your errors. Mm -hmm. um, and there's always a lot of them. And uh, what, One thing I'm looking for is that they're near zero, or the average near zero, but then you can look for bias. So here, this is the error size from you know, zero to 25 to 50%, either plus or minus. And then going across, this is the size of the property. So it's $250,000 home is here, $500,000 home is here, $1 million home is here. Well, if you look at the errors, it, I do pick up a little bias here. It, it does look like um, as you come kind of over our median home value, close to 500000 those are more likely to be below zero uh, than not. And I don't know what's driving that. Um, this looks, you know, really clean to me. With, with the, we also have a lot more, num lot more parcels here. So you get the law of large numbers that comes into play. But that's, those are the types of things you can look at across different dimensions to, to try to understand where you might be able to make tweaks. Um, that will make you more accurate in the future. But again, there's nothing that's jumping out at me here that says um, mm. the results are horrible. And I, I think it's safe to say that they're better than they were um, by a pretty good margin. Yeah. 
And John, those residuals, that's that's 156 dots from your, you testing your data? No, these are the 795. <coughs> okay, those are seven. Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay. Heading to look a kind of closer look at the three areas that we mentioned in the agenda, Higgins Beach, um, Hillcrest, and Prouts. So, Dave? Just on your reference, there's a full, complete list in your packet, and these are available online, and it, uh, it's the entirety of two different tax maps. And Higgins Beach is fairly easy because it's kind of everything on the water side of Spurling. Like. The Higgins Beach... Uh, <clears throat> Higgins Beach has a lot of uh, small lots, 50 by 100, and uh, KRT basically um, used the same value or assessed them for the same value pretty much across the board, unless they were close to or on the ocean. Um, and uh, I think they were a little, they were too strong in the, in the land values to begin with initially. Um, and when they did the ratio study, uh, it came out to 110%. So uh, I told them that they had to come down uh, 10% uh, across the board. Mm -hmm. They also, uh, as part of their methodology, they, uh, they, they kind of got hung up on, on trying to estimate the value <coughs> of, of views, and, uh, which, is, which is difficult uh, to explain. Uh, to a property owner. Uh, for example, if you have two identical lots side by side, one has an old cottage on it, and the other one has a brand new three-story building with a deck on the roof that offers an ocean view, uh, they, were, they were favoring that one and giving that more value on the land. Uh, uh, so to me, that was... I, I don't agree with that methodology. So, so I, I reviewed the whole Higgins Beach and, and I adjusted those lots uh, because uh, to try to explain that to a property owner whose, whose uh, lot is now two or $300,000 more than the neighbor with an identical lot uh, w would be very hard to explain and justify. Uh, okay. So that's one of the changes that that I made. Um, but you could make an adjustment on the, on the <coughs> house. It's on oh, the house. I mean, yeah. that's going to make the difference. That's, that's where the, the difference house. is. Uh, the cottage may be worth maybe 100000 right. at the most, and that three story house right. is worth 500000 500, right. Yeah. So that's, that's where the difference is. And why did that, why did they do that just in Higgins Beach? I mean, that they explanation. Did, they, didn't, they didn't. They uh, didn't. But so it was, you, it was. It was common there. Higgins Beach is changing. It's it's in uh, it, 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 you know it's it's uh, that's I guess that's the uh, um, that's that's what's happening in Higgins Beach, uh, which is uh, going through a, a significant change. Uh, people are buying properties with older cottages, tearing them down, and building these big, huge houses. Um, but if it wasn't just Higgins Beach, did you all <coughs> go back and make the appropriate adjustments at Pine Point? Uh, it Wasn't happened at similar Pillsbury issue? Shores. Snacks, it happened at Pillsbury Shores. So you, across well. the board, yeah. for all properties, yeah. made the adjustment for the land value? Well, Higgins, Higgins Beach and, and Pine Point, uh, that's, that's really not an issue at Prouts Neck. Uh, because they're almost all big. <laughs> well, and those changes were made on the view, the, the view component. It's worth noting KRT uh, was adamant that that view should be taken into consideration. So, at the end, they certainly defer to the assessor's decision. He's uh, he's justified in making that decision, but they believe very strongly that view should be taken into consideration, and that's the methodology they use and all the work they do elsewhere. But I think Dave's opinion is the one that matters the most. Is the one that commits another, the value. Another problem with Higgins Beach is um, they didn't have any waterfront sales or, or anything close to to the water, uh, but they, you know, they ha they had to put values on the waterfront lots, and they did. I felt those were too high initially, and that was part of, uh, and then as part of reducing everything across the board, they reduced those waterfront lots. 
specifically down uh, on shipwreck. Uh, they initially started at 1.3 million, uh, and with with the with the reduction, uh, they're down to about 1.1 million. Uh, one of the properties there just went on the market two weeks ago, mm -hmm. and it's now under contract. And <clears throat> I went down and met with those people Saturday, Saturday morning, and the owner of the property told me that uh, she couldn't tell me what the price was, but she said it is, uh, the contract price is less than the assessment. Uh, so I'm going to wait to find out what that sale price is, because that <laughs> is going to be my best indicator, and then adjust those lots uh, accordingly. Uh, so so there's, there's still work to do there at Hayden's Beach, and I, <clears throat> I hope that next year that will be looked at again, you know, to tr kind of fine tune uh, what the value should be there. Okay. Um, and that's kind of what he was just speaking to there. So moving on to look at Hillcrest. Hillcrest. Uh, Hillcrest uh, has been um, <coughs> has been very difficult. Um, sales data from Hillcrest has been very difficult to get from from Hillcrest. Uh, uh, these units are uh, sold. Uh, they're pretty. They're pretty uh, consistent throughout the park. Or the community. Uh, they're, they're, uh, they're prefab. They're built in Pennsylvania and then shipped up here and set on, on the slabs. Uh, they don't own the slab. They don't own the land. They only own the units. And the prices have gone up to $300,000. Uh, it was obvious to me that it would not cost $300,000 to build one of these or to buy one. <clears throat> so there was an intrinsic value included in that sale price. KRT either ignored that or didn't quite understand that. Uh, so they tried to match the assessments with the prices. And so, that's, well, that's why we had... That's why they were basically over assessed, uh, and that's why we had all the trouble with 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 uh, Hillcrest. So we, you know, we <coughs> conferred and, uh, and and decided that there was that intrinsic value. A lot of that was in the land. So we, Larissa, mostly came up with a formula to extract that mm -hmm. from the sale price and give us a more realistic value of what those units should be. And uh, so I think we, we got those down to uh, where realistically what their values are. Uh, the, the next uh, challenge for me is to go in and uh, look at the old mobile homes, which I think are still over-assessed. Uh, so I'll be doing that. and and possibly making more adjustments. Is the commercial valuation in Hillcrest, does that need to be adjusted? Or are we good on that? Given no, I, I, I think we're good on that. Uh, okay. It's mostly the land value. Well, that's what I'm saying. Are we, have, do we have that land value or not? Given what we found out from going in, there was a sizable, going through this there was a sizable adjustment last year as part of the commercial yeah. industrial okay. review. I think it's worth looking at because yeah. under normal circumstances, the building value is what it is, right. and when you compare that to the sales price, what's the difference? Exactly. Everything's wrapped up in the land. In this case, yeah. it's unique because the land's not owned. Right. So uh, I think it, it's still going to require some additional attention to <coughs> yeah. perfect this. Yeah. I just want to make a comment on this neighborhood in general because for me, this is the perfect example of supply and demand and, and something that I, you know, failed as a counselor to address, um, but I would love future counselors to continue to carry uh, this and be looking at it is, is there a, the reason those sales prices have inflated is because that's what people are looking for. 
mm -hmm. right? They want single level living 55 plus neighborhoods. We don't have enough of them. And how can we incentivize and work with our developers to be building another neighborhood like Juneberry, Magnolia, and not Hillcrest per se, right. but those t that type of housing? Because um, I see it as a huge gap in our community right now, uh, which is really what has caused those, you know, sales prices to go up yeah. and be, be as inflated as they have been. Well, people are willing to pay those prices. Because there's nothing be else in, available. To be in Hillcrest. <laughs> uh, right. And, and they just, most, yeah. most of the people there just love to be there. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and but if they had they, a choice, like, to buy that same property in another neighborhood where they actually own the land, in, in roughly this, they same, would do that all day at long. At the same price point. Yeah. Three to 350, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. They do it all day long. Yeah. They just there's nothing like that, and so. <coughs> that's kind of but why the market hasn't responded to that is curious. The, 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 there's not it's, enough profit margin. It's, there's the more money to make a four or five bedroom colonial. <laughs> uh, it's all about the cost of construction, and, mm -hmm. and then yeah. again, so I, I think as a town we have to take a look at how do we again, you know I know we take a lot of heat for incentivizing projects for developers, but for me, this is the exact kind of project that I would feel very good about incentivizing in some way mm -hmm. because it, it makes the most sense and it's and that those kinds of communities and neighborhoods are not going to be a tax burden. They're gonna be a contributor. I think a lot of people uh, uh, might disagree, this, disagree with us in how we calculated those values and attributed some of that to the land. Um, but I kind of compare it to uh, Piper Shores. Uh, Piper Shores, you need, you need two to eight hundred thousand dollars to get in the place. Uh, so you need two hundred fifty thousand dollars to get into Hillcrest. So let's, let's kind of compare that. Uh, so let's average five hundred thousand to get into Piper Shores, and you multiply that by the number of units, which is 200, uh, 280, I think 290 units total. So if you, if you do the math, uh, Piper Shores should be worth about $145 million, right. and it's not. We have like $85 million on it. So there's that <coughs> intrinsic value again that, you know, it's... Um, you know, they don't own the land. Uh, they, they're basically buying an apartment uh, temporarily, uh, and they're doing the same thing at Hillcrest. So. In the spirit of time, is everyone ready to yeah. go to Prouts? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Prouts Neck, um, yeah. uh, I remember I wasn't here, but I... I wasn't working here, but um, it's always it's always been difficult um, <clears throat> to examine Proud Snack because of the lack of sales. I remember when Paul um, made some changes in 2012. He only had like six sales, and he had to go back six years to get those six sales. We've been fortunate in the past few years to have. Uh, more sales at Proud Snack, which has helped us to, you know, get a better idea of what the value should be. Um, so this is a, this is a, there were some uh, challenges with size and fit. So this is a sample to kind of the to show that Prouts has been overassessed for a number of years based on the sales data that we have. Um, some of the questions that people had was, you know, why would we see decreases in value at our most valuable property? And again, because a mass appraisal is driven by sales, this is an example of, of some of those sales that were really out of line with where the assessments were. I started, I started to, uh, to study Prouts when I, when I came uh, in the beginning of uh, 2018. Uh, 2000, 2018. Um, <coughs> The, um, as a result of that, um, I reduced the land values on the waterfront <clears throat> uh, last year for 2018. And this year, I reduced them again 
and the interior lots, some were, some were low and some were high, so there was a mix there. <coughs> but uh, when looking at the 2017 and 2018 sales, uh, when the ratio, townwide ratio for residential <coughs> was uh, like 86% or something like that, mid 80s, uh, Proutsnack <coughs> was at 122%. Uh, and I've had a lot of feedback from people coming in asking me, well, how come Prout's Neck went down? Well, this is why. Because for years, Prout's Neck had been uh, overpriced. And the trend lately is, is, uh, is a downward uh, direction for Prout's Neck. Uh, and the reasons for it, that, as far as I can tell, is... Um, some of those properties are being passed down to children and grandchildren, and they simply don't want them for a number of reasons. Uh, they can't afford them, or they just have no interest in, uh, you know, paying the taxes and the maintenance to, to go there for two weeks out of the year. Uh, <coughs> so there's a change of the guards, so to speak. Uh, but I think, uh, and Prasenak is very difficult to work with because there's, there seems to be uh, some kind of secrecy about divulging exactly what is involved with the sales. You know, there, there could be side deals or, or um, you know, somebody is related to someone else. It's, it's always been really difficult to, uh, uh, to get, you know, get the facts. Um, but since, uh, since the reval, uh, there's been a couple of sales there. Um, number one, Winslow Homer Road. Uh, we dropped the assessment the other three million two hundred ninety-six thousand, and it just sold, I believe, yesterday for around three point three million. And to further refine that, so at its previous assessment of four million fifty-eight thousand, at that selling price, it would have been at a sales ratio of one hundred twenty-two percent. 122.6. Yeah. At its new assessment, its sales ratio is 99.6%. So it, it, that, that's a win. And then uh, 6 Harmon Street, um, we have it assessed for one, almost 1 1.9 million. Uh, this sold in 2018 for 2,050,000, and it just sold again for 2,250,000. So we're pretty close there as well. And so, again, to kind of dig deeper on that one, it's actually its previous assessment was $1.59 million. So that one actually went up. That's an yeah. example of a Prout's Neck property that the assessed value increased by $300,000. So at its previous assessment, it would have sold with a sales ratio of 70%. And because of the increase in the assessment through the modeling that's been done, it sold at an 83.4%. So that's bringing us much closer to where we want to be. Yeah. Is it perfect? No, but it was much closer. It's, it's really difficult. There were two sales uh, on Massacre Lane down on the beach uh, that seemed, the sale prices seemed to be low over the past two years. Um, and, then, and then this past year, uh, there was a sale, I forget, one of the lanes on the beach, and it sold for $4.5 million. Mm -hmm. Just doesn't make any sense. Um, and, uh, you know, I, we don't know what to think of it. Uh, but that's, that's, what we're, that's what we see at Proud Snack. When you think you know what's going on, you get a sale that just uh, destroys your, your theory. But the, the difference is we've had uh, an unprecedented amount of what we'll call bona fide sales uh, over the last couple of years. And that's something that hasn't yeah. occurred in the last 20 years. And we have some theories why. So it does begin to help us understand where those values are. And in, it's ironic, but I think Pouch Neck is a great example of why we do this. It's about establishing equity. And in this case, uh, it was uh, a downward adjustment to establish equity. So I'm going to kind of keep going because I want to make sure that we have um, get through some of the really important pieces. Of. So that's what happened and kind of what we think of as the results that we've seen. So where do we go from here? And the first thing I think was really important to me was to meet the staff and reflect back. What did we learn? And where, where did we 
make choices that if we had chosen differently, better results would have happened. And so first and foremost, I think that this workshop happening before we started the revaluation would have been a great choice. Let's establish some shared expectations of what success looks like. What do we want to see for um, an entry rate? What do we want to see for a, when we do that statistical analysis, what are we going to feel good about coming out the other side with? And if we had had a shared expectation ahead of time, A, we would have had clear um, targets to be hitting. And so we would have been able to say, all right, remember, we all agreed that these were the parameters we were trying to meet. And either we hit it or we didn't hit it. Instead of having um, kind of, I think, misunderstandings about what mass appraisal can and can't do. And um, may, I think like entry rate was one of the places. I think that there was a real expectation that that entry rate should be 80, 90 percent. And so it was, if we had had this conversation ahead of time and everyone had heard, industry standard of entry rate is 45 to 50 percent. Let's agree that if we hit 50 percent, we're going to be satisfied with that, that that would have helped alleviate some of the, the, um, the stress midpoint. Next thing is that, and we talked about this already, that reval the pre-revaluation messaging, although I think it was fairly strong, it could have been even more thorough. Really helping people understand what mass appraisal was, or is rather, help them understand about property tax and its challenges. Those are pieces that we could have been more thorough on that we, we didn't do. Another one that would have been a, a simple lift, and um, certainly going forward, kind of as we're adding those lists of things that we can put on those RFPs, if the KRT contract had included a requirement that a property card were in, was included in the initial values mailing, a lot of our residents' stress and angst could have been alleviated. And that's a great lesson for us to learn moving forward with this one. Larissa, and, did KRT learn that lesson as well? Do you know? I, I don't know, and I certainly don't want to speak for a private <coughs> yeah, sure, company. Yeah. Um, was it discussed among staff in KRT that this was a point I, that could have? Yep. Okay. Um, it's not, again, they have done these mass appraisals yeah, right, in sure. many, many communities, yeah. and they've never had this sort of reaction. Sure. Yeah. So I think that it's um, special. We are, and I think that it should but be we really. We knew that going we in. Knew, and we <laughs> warned them about that going in. But it comes with having, I mean, we're really proud of our voter participation rate, right? And it's that same sort of, if you're a community that can get that many people out to vote, then you're a community that's going to have a lot of engagement when you're doing something like a revaluation as well. Um, again, and we've talked about this repeatedly, more time for each phase would have allowed for better communication, in-house review, everything. Um, so a great lesson moving forward is let's have a plan for when these revals are going to happen. Let's make sure that they can be done all at, kind of all at once instead of having this rush to complete the residential because we've done the commercial and we need to be equal. I mean, property tax, we've talked about horribly regressive tax. The only thing it has going for it is its equal distribution of unfairness. Okay, so we, we needed to get these done quickly. Um, and a major lesson is let's not allow this to go for 14 years again. A lot of the stress for folks was that they have had 14 years of a, an area of the state that has seen really just high, high demand and those prices being pushed really high up. I had a constituent ask me today if we were planning to mail property cards to our residents. Is, is that something that, that is even being considered at this point? So we, um, staff certainly looked into it. It's going to cost $7,700 at this point to mail property cards. Um, and we tried to do it with the property tax bills. It would have been um, quite a bit less than that $7,700. But if you'll remember, because we were waiting, the property tax bills, we didn't want to have them be delayed especially in a revaluation year. We never want them to go out later than September 15th, but in this revaluation year, we certainly didn't want to delay them. And we didn't have the property card data even available to us until September 12th. And so they, there was no way to get the property cards out with the bills. That was just impossible to do without delaying those bills going out by a week, which seemed like a really bad choice given the, the new values and people's concern about getting those bills paid by October 15th. So. That's for really council to direct us. If that's if that is a priority for you, we'll need to figure out where we're going to find where we're going to spend that seventy seven hundred dollars from. Um, but the, I think that if you guys want to have that conversation, I would ask that you let me kind of walk you through what is available for people online. What I have been sharing with folks, um, and it was in the leader last week. Anyone that would like a property card mailed to them simply has to call our office, and we're happy to have that happen. Or come into our office, we print it for them there, and send it home with them. So 
people, if they wish to have a physical property card and they don't have online access themselves, we are really happy to accommodate that and, and eager to do so for people that let us know. Um, and so we can also brainstorm. We've got a communications meeting next Monday, maybe ways that we can reach the populations that we think might have harder, um, less opportunity to access things online. I think that there are ways for us to do this without spending $7,700. But if council, if that's a priority for you, clearly staff will, will do what is voted on. Um, so let's take a quick look at some of the, the cool new toys that people have to play with. So um, these online property cards have been up for quite a while. Um, so this is direct, you can link from this directly from our website. It's on the assessing page. It says vision database. Um, Jean Marie has graciously offered us up her home as an example. Um, so when you go in, when you first get there, you've got this kind of card that um, shows the sketch. It has all of the information that post people want, but it is not what you would get if you were to, uh, you know, ask, come into the, the office and ask for your property card. To get that, you're going to need to go to the, at the top of the screen, you see that little red bar that says field card? When you click that, you get the property card that people are familiar with. And um, the next tool, so this shows, has the same sketch. Um, it also it will have a photo there soon. They're still working on getting the photos added to them. If you come into the office, the property card that we can print for you in the office will have the photo of your home on it. But at the moment, they don't. Um, so that's what is available on the property cards um, through Vision Database. Um, in order to help you understand how to read that property card, also now on the assessing web page, you have a, um, a guide a legend, if you will. So I'm going to just scroll down to the bottom of it very quickly so people can see what's at the, at the, in this legend is a property card with all of its personal information redacted. Um, but it's, it's been broken down into zones or areas with numbers on them. OK? And then the, the copy at the top here, all of this, this writing, walks you through each of those sections and explains what is in them. Extremely helpful. Great. Uh, um, anyone that has any further questions, if, if this, again, either you don't have online access or you are looking at this and it's still not making sense, we've got a great staff down there. Emily and Sue and Dave have been constantly available. One of the great, one of the great things that came out of this was a conversation with KRT. One of their owners said to me, I've never worked in a town before where the assessing staff has been willing to stay until 9 o'clock at night to make sure that this project gets done right. And our staff has been. And they've been there, and um, they've had people crying, they've had people screaming, they've had people scared, and I've really been impressed with the quality of the service that they've been able to provide, and this will continue. So if people want some help understanding this legend and, and working through, I feel really confident that um, Emily, Sue, and Dave are going to be there to help them with that. I, of course, am always a, a backup, um, but those are the experts that can best serve our residents in that way. I'm mindful of time. Are we okay just to extend a, a bit? We're I think so. five minutes and for folks that have hung with us <coughs> we had on the agenda public comment what we'll do is when we transfer into the main meeting the first item on the agenda is public comment so if anybody wants to make comments about what they've heard they'll be welcome to do so <coughs> thank you and the last snazzy piece that we're very excited about and this will go live tomorrow john has already <coughs> got to see a little preview he's very excited too um we have a very talented gis coordinator named michael warnock on our staff and he has built what I hope um, people will really enjoy playing with. Um, so I just want to walk you through it quickly. It is available. It's going to be, again, directly linked from our um, assessing web page. And this is the town broken down um, by color scale. On your left-hand side, you get to choose your, le your layers. Um, so this is showing a percent tax bill increase. OK, so that, that's just the layer I have clicked right now. Um, if I want to, so the, that very light blue means that they, this property saw less than a 5% increase in their tax bill. The darkest purple shows over 100% increase in the tax bill. When I zoom in, and this is where this map starts to get very cool. Um, when you go in, first, those sales are reflected on this map. So let's say you happen to live at this parcel here that I'm, I'm pointing with my cursor, OK? And you're wondering if your assessment actually makes sense. Well, now you can look and see what the properties right nearby to you have sold for as kind of a starting place to kind of self-assess whether or not your assessment is fair market value, OK? And if you click on that little house icon, little flag, I guess, 
Um, please work. Um, this is not showing it as well as it does on my computer, at, um, on the full computer, so I'm not sure what's going on with the laptop, I apologize. But you get your owner information, you get the new assessment, and then you can click right to that vision database that we walked through earlier. And you can also click to a new item that's going to be there, not just in this map, but also on the um, website. If when you're looking at your property card, you feel that there's an error on there, you have three bedrooms, not four, okay, um, or something along those lines, this is an easy way for people to just send that into the assessing department, okay? So they'll be able to do that fairly quickly and easily. Um, I want to go back to our map. Um, other features, if we want to look at how assessments themselves have changed, um, we can look at the total assessment um, change. That's going to be in these green shades. Again, we can see, when we zoom in close enough, we're going to be able to see those sales in the different areas. Um, when I click on a parcel, again, the laptop's not, do please play with this at home tomorrow morning. Um, it opens up, when you click on it, it opens up a, a, a dialog box or something yeah. that shows that information that when I clicked and opened up a new screen for. So it's right there for folks. Um, should be really easy to use. This will be live tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yep. And then in order for people to kind of really see where, what was driving those assessments, um, we, in, we broke it down further. So you can look at and see what um, percent assessed land changes happened, or you can look at it from building changes, okay? And there's a lot of interesting things that um, really came out of this exercise. One of them is where we saw some of the biggest changes in value were on our largest parcels of land. And so that was kind of just great to see visually. And I've actually already been on the phone with one of those landowners. That's an opportunity for us to provide great resident service by letting them know about the main current use programs. Do they want to put that land in open space or in um, tree growth? Is that If they're not interested in developing that land, do they wish to shield some of that taxable value through some of those conservation programs? So that'll be live tomorrow, um, and we're hoping that people enjoy working with that. Um, yeah? Can you make some little cute, not immediately, but when you have on all your spare time, mm -hmm some cute little like how-to videos and maybe... I would love to do that. I think that would be great. Can we agree that those will be done by the end of next week? I was going to give you a three months. So. I, think that we could, I think we could have at least bar, bar, one bar. of those videos done by the end of next week. I just, I, I send people to the site all the time and to using the GIS and, and then they, they get confused when they get in there. So if they had something like that that we could send out, no, it'd be that's great. a great and we can make sure that that's shared both on the website right next to where they would find that map Perfect. through our Facebook feed and yeah. through um, our newsletter that will go out on the 15th. Yep. Okay. Yes. Um, and then just very quickly, Dave, um, I think we already hit on this a little bit, but what could we do as one option moving forward? Uh, what I would do is uh, implement the state mandate that uh, requires the uh, assessing department to review every property once every four years. Mm -hmm. state I would, mandate. I would, yeah. So this would be state legislation to lobby for. What's that? No, it's it's in uh, it's, it, it's in state law. Uh, He's saying implement it. Oh, it was already there. Implement. We just didn't do oh, it. Yeah. We didn't do it. Oh, implement. Right. Okay, gotcha. Um, and that would that would involve uh, inspecting one quarter of the properties every year. And then when that's completed, to update the values the fifth year. Uh, this would allow for uh, local control <coughs> by the assessing department. It would also provide more consistency. Um, KRT hired a number of people to go out and do field uh, inspections. Uh, some had experience, some did not. Uh, and what I found in many cases, um, we're in the same subdivision with houses built the same year. I saw uh, various degrees of quality grade, condition of the improvements, uh, and things like that, uh, which uh, would be uh, streamlined and, and better, uh, you know, better uh, represented if uh, everything was under the control of the assessing department. Tom, it wasn't insignificant, the resources we paid KRT, right, wasn't it? Pardon? All in, we paid K KRT about 500000 for both commercial and... No, it was... We're close to four. Oh, for, for both. Yeah, yeah, for both. It was uh, close. Just over 400000 <coughs> So if those resources could be used by our own 
team. Sure. Yeah, I, I also want to add, uh, you could not do this with the current staff. Yeah. Uh, so you'd you'd have to increase the staff. But there's 400,000 yeah. prisoners. Sure. Right. right. Um, and we were hoping to have time for questions. Perhaps this is um, not the time. But if you do have further questions, please send them by email. And like I said, any questions that you have, we can make sure that we you know, make public through the website if that's what's, what is wanted um, so that there's a continued conversation that we can kind of wrap this up with. Um, but just kind of shoot them our way, and, and we'll do our very best to get them answered as timely as possible. And, and I guess for any town council members that have any suggestions about things to add, like to the process, uh, the improvements, maybe just copy everybody and send them to staff, and they can assemble yeah. and review them. And see. if there's other tools you can think of that would be of value to the public, uh, we'll do our best to try to deliver those. Does anybody else have any closing comments, thoughts? I have time along the way. So, come on. You guys did a great yeah. job. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank a lot of information, John. Thank you for all your <laughs> <laughs> being volunteered or. John, thank you. Totally <laughs>